In the last part of the previous video, we delved into Frank Lloyd Wright's transition to his true identity with the Winslow House, his first independent commission after completing a five-year contract. Despite maintaining excellent relations with his mentor Sullivan, Wright established his own practice, primarily focusing on residential architecture. In these 15 years, they constructed over 100 buildings, a remarkable achievement. As one client brought in another, the projects were often houses, each with its uniqueness. Elements of his architectural language that would further develop over time are already unmistakably present in Wright's work. Is it influenced by Sullivan? Yes, in certain aspects. The overall organization reflects solemnity and symmetry, with a low base, a central body, and a crowning feature, often emphasized by a substantial eave or roof overhang. Now, we will continue exploring Wright's unique evolution in the next stage of his career. Coming back to the lecture, now, if we look at the house more closely, we see that there are indeed traces of Sullivan. This is the door that you saw before. The door you see here now is a bit larger, and we notice that it features the same floral decorations that Sullivan had used in his buildings, many of which had influenced the good Wright, and some that Wright himself had drawn. So, yes, there is still something of Sullivan, but it's the goddess Sullivan and the beginning of an independent creative trajectory. So, in this drawing, you can see a quite extreme contrast between the sides. It's a drawing of the side of the house where you get a glimpse of the front part of the house, formal as Sullivan might have done it, and then the back part where it breaks down in a somewhat picturesque and romantic way into volumes. Take a look at the back part of the same house. It looks like a different architecture, as if it were done by another architect. Wright is starting to be himself, leaving behind Sullivan's legacy and beginning to create a new architecture. This new architecture would crystallize into what would be called the Prairie Houses. As he coined them, these were houses dedicated to the emerging bourgeoisie, people with money in Chicago who didn't want to live in the noisy and brutal city. Instead, they opted for these new residential developments with tree-lined houses, such as Oak Park, where Frank Lloyd Wright himself lived in that suburb, as Americans call it, and in similar areas. He constructed numerous houses, introducing a new style that emphasized horizontal lines, replacing the somewhat boxy organization of architecture with screens that don't quite meet. The windows ceased to be rectangles that were cut out and became bands between brick panels or beneath large eaves. A young and ambitious architect needs to advertise, and Frank Lloyd Wright did just that. However, he didn't do it in architecture magazines or general press. Instead, he chose decoration-focused magazines with a predominantly female audience, notably in the Ladies' Home Journal. For this publication, he drew two houses. The one at the top, he named it A House in the Prairie, and the one below, he called it A Small House with Lots of Room in It. After drawing them, he published these designs. In the year 1901, in that decoration-focused magazine, as I mentioned, the Ladies' Home Journal with a predominantly female audience, these were his proposals, home in a prairie town and a small house with lots of room in it. Thanks to his ability to communicate his work, he gained numerous clients who knew they were getting something more than what other, more commercial architects were offering. Additionally, he provided houses with levels of comfort that were not common luxuries at the time, including hot and cold running water, assisted ventilation, features that were exceptional in the world of Chicago during that period. He even undertook projects where houses began to be grouped together, thinking not only of individual clients, but also engaging with developers who could build several houses at once and then sell them. And all this sort of geometry, based on elementary forms, he drew from as he repeatedly emphasized. And as Le Corbusier later also mentioned, 
these Frebel's games. Frebel was a great pedagogue, the creator of the kindergarten, and Skinner Ganter, both Germans. He believed that children should educate their sensibilities from a young age by playing with geometric shapes. So these Frebel's games, one of which his mother bought for him, always attentive to fostering the young boy's creativity, were, as for Wright and many other modern architects, something unique. Many have mentioned how Frebel's games marked their childhood. He used to say, I still remember the touch of those wooden cubes, you know, on my fingers. These games allowed him to reach such extreme abstractions as this house. The Martin House is extraordinary, and William Curtis has compared it to a Mondrian painting, although the painting came ten years later. Indeed, as time progressed, Frank Lloyd Wright began to attract clients with more resources. In this case, it was Darwin Martin, the manager of a large company, who could afford a house with large pergolas, guest pavilions, and more. But if you look at the floor plan, you can see to what extent this way of conceiving space has much in common with the Dutch neoplasticism. Certainly, this is the same house we've seen before, but now with a perspective, one of those that he liked to create, mimicking Japanese prints with very extreme, elongated forms, whether horizontal or vertical. This is the one he created afterward for a significant publication showcasing his work in the 1910s in Germany, which became hugely influential in Europe, the Wasmuth Portfolio, which we'll discuss later. In this portfolio, his houses were redrawn to explain them to the general public and his colleagues. They were also directly influenced by Japanese prints, like this one. He drew it in 1905 after his first trip to Japan. His initial journey to Japan was on the invitation of clients who had grown quite fond of him. Wright had a knack for endearing himself to people, and even when his houses ended up costing more than he estimated, people forgave him. They even took him on trips to broaden his horizons. These particular clients took him to Japan, where he confirmed everything he already knew about Japan and what he had discovered when he saw that temple in the Columbian Exposition in 1893. He always said, My two references are Berlin and Tokyo. He thought of Japan and Germany continuously. However, he faced difficulties during World War II when the United States was at war with both of his reference countries. Yet during that time, Japan was still his promised land. Of course, the houses he designed during that time for clients like Compley, with vast expanses of land that could unfold, are depicted in this plan, right? And I'm going to show you a black and white photo of how these houses were, with a layout of pergolas, ponds, but always with Frank Lloyd Wright's signature elements, the large overhangs, horizontal orientation, and the emphasis on the desire to meld with the terrain, to identify with it. He called this organic, and for him, organic didn't just mean things twisting. Sometimes, it meant a relationship between the parts and the whole. It also signified a willingness to commune with the landscape. Years later, in one of his last works, Taliesin West, located in the middle of the Arizona desert, Frank Lloyd Wright asked his master, what will happen to all of this in 50 years? The master replied, in 50 years, the desert will have reclaimed what is rightfully its own, referring to the location where he had built. However, he continued, but I will have liberated the American housewife from the box of New England, meaning the typical houses where all Americans lived. He transformed the box with a cover into a kind of exquisite ranch, where every part of the design, very much in the 19th century romantic tradition, is a total work of art. In this approach, every detail is connected to the whole and the furniture, windows, gardening, everything is part of a unique creative effort. While not as grand as this house, a hundred of these were built in 15 years, which was an extraordinary and colossal creative endeavor. Thus, the prairie houses remain in our consciousness as something that is difficult to surpass. The sequence may not be finished, 
but as the most significant piece, it made this. In Chicago, on a challenging, narrow, and very urban plot, which would become the masterpiece of the collection, I prefer to show it to you with, with a photographic image. If Frank Lloyd Wright had disappeared, he would already be an important architect with everything he had done, transforming the American house and changing the history of architecture. But it didn't end there. In addition to these extraordinary houses, Frank Lloyd Wright also created two formidable public works. Of course. In the next chapter, we can continue exploring the creation of Frank Lloyd Wright's public works and his trajectory throughout his career. If you have more questions or if there's anything specific you'd like to know, please feel free to ask. I'm here to assist you. Thank you for your time and I hope you will enjoy this video. Please subscribe to see more videos and see you on the next chapter.